Well, thanks so much for all of you for being here tonight. Thanks to our gracious host, Changing Hands. Independent bookstores like these are a treasure and we should support them whenever we can. That's why no one's getting out of here tonight until every copy over there is sold. <laughs> so my book is Founding Rivals, James Madison, James, uh, James Madison versus James Monroe, The Bill of Rights and the Election That Saved a Nation. For those of you who showed up to see the lead guitarist of KISS, I regret to inform you that that was last night. <laughs> you know, uh, for as important as this project has become to my life, I can scarcely remember the first time I learned about this historic congressional race between two future presidents in 1789. But what I do remember is reading about it in a book, and it was treated with the typical one or two sentences that you would see about this congressional race. And I thought to myself, way to bury the lead. All of a sudden, we're in this race between two future presidents, James Madison, James Monroe. They're debating the most important issues we've ever talked about as a country, whether we should have a Bill of Rights, what kind of union sh we should have. And then all of a, all of a sudden, you're, next, you're in the next page, and they're in the first Congress. And I said, way to bury the lead. So I decided I would read everything that I could about this 1789 election. And when I found that no one had ever written anything about it before, I decided that I was going to tell this story. The book Founding Rivals cold opens at the inauguration of George Washington. What many people don't know is that when he took the oath of office, two of the 13 states were outside the Union. North Carolina and Rhode Island did not ratify the Constitution because of their concern that it was missing a Bill of Rights, a guarantee of fundamental liberties. This was common for the Anti-Federalists throughout the continent. The common denominator among the Anti-Federalists, of which James Monroe was one, was that they opposed the Constitution. Many of them came at it from different angles. Some of them genuinely believed that you could not have a union that covered all these different and diverse states. They believed in maybe independent states or perhaps regional confederacies, but they didn't think that any government could ever be suitable to this entire continent. James Monroe represented the majority of Anti-Federalist opinion in that his objection to the Constitution was centered around its missing a Bill of Rights. While Washington took the oath of office, two states, New York and Virginia, were agitating for a new constitutional convention. In the words of James Madison and George Washington, they were terrified at this prospect. They believed that it would be infiltrated by enemies of the new government and that the Constitution would be scrapped and done away with and that our union would be fractured, never ever to come together again. The book then goes into the French and Indian War, which was a conflict fraught between in the New World and in Europe, maybe perhaps the first true world war we've ever had, between the French and the English and their allies. As a result of this war, the English expelled their opponents from the continent. But as a consequence, what they did was remove a check that kept their colonists in terror. Free from the threat of the French, the American colonists were not so reliant on Great Britain. Great Britain also tried to shoulder some of the enormous cost of this onto the colonies. What followed was a rising cycle of taxation, resistance, followed by oppression, past the point of no return, where we, where we ended up in a revolution against Great Britain. Both Madison and Monroe played important roles in the revolution. James Monroe was a student at the College of William and Mary when hostilities began. As a student, he wasn't excited by Latin or grammar. He was out drilling on the college green at William and Mary with his compatriots. The governor of Virginia, Lord Dunmore, the royal appointee, seized the gunpowder of the militia in town. Nobody bought his excuse, which was that he was fearing a slave revolt. When that ratcheted up hostilities in the Virginia continent to the point where James Monroe and his compatriots raided the governor's mansion, uh, which is still there today if you've ever been to Colonial Williamsburg. Monroe was then sent north to New York to join with George Washington's army. And he would serve with Washington in many theaters of the war, places like Valley Forge, Germantown, the Philadelphia Campaign, and, the, and most importantly, the Battle of Trenton. We all know this famous portrait of George Washington crossing the Delaware and, and going over to face uh, the Hessians who were not expecting it. Uh, Monroe led a vanguard of men across the river in that important battle. Their job in the morning before the war was to secure the street heading into town so that no one would be able to alert the British and their allies as to what was about to happen. It was Christmas. They had been, there had been some revelry. They, they thought that the hostilities had ceased for the season and they were unprepared for the attack. 
In the process, James Monroe and his men alerted a doctor by the name of Riker. They woke him up. He came outside and started cursing at them because he thought they were British. When he realized they were patriots, he told them, I too am a patriot, and it seems that something is, is going to happen tomorrow, and I'm going to go with you because I may be able to save some poor soul. Well, that poor soul turned out to be James Monroe, the future president of the United States. During a critical moment of the battle, James Monroe charged the cannons, was struck down by a bullet, and would have bled out right there in the street before Trenton had it not been for Dr. Riker. This is one of two incidents in the book where James Monroe narrowly escapes death. One of the things I focus on in Founding Rivals is just how precarious everything that happened really was and how seemingly small and minor and unrelated events conspire to make great events happen on the stage of history. During the Revolutionary War, James Madison served in the U.S. Congress. Well, he when he arrived in Congress, he found an absolutely ruinous state of affairs. I know it's nothing like you could imagine today, but the... <laughs> <laughs> the Congress had already taken an enormous crippling national debt. When Congress had exhausted its revenue and exhausted its sources of credit, they simply started printing money and giving it out to people. <laughs> Thank goodness our leaders today are too wise to do this. <laughs> I think it's really telling that Madison serves on something called the Board of Admiralty. This was a committee that ran the naval affairs of the United States during the war. One of the first things they do is to deny a three-month-old request for a sea captain for bread and flour. It was not that this request was unreasonable per se, it was simply that they had no bread or flour or means to procure it to give them. They did send him a note, however, telling him to keep up the good work. <laughs> An 18-gun boat named the Saratoga was sitting in the dock instead of fighting the British for a want of simple riggings. The Trumbull, with 120 men on it, ready to go to sea and fight the British, was waiting on just a few more cannon and a little bit more food before it could be deployed. And perhaps worst of all, the Board of Admiralty had to deal with the issue of several common criminals breaking into a warehouse and stealing all but a few bolts of the entire national supply of canvas. Perhaps they were in inspired by George Washington's daring Christmas raid because one Christmas night they broke in, they stole the canvas, Congress had already directed them to distribute this canvas to the places where it was needed. The orders weren't heeded, and the letters to the Board of Admiralty are actually pretty humorous if it wasn't so serious. The, the men in charge of the warehouse said, we've killed three of the men responsible. We think we know where to find the fourth. And Congress wrote back saying, well, that's nice, but we just want our canvas back. <laughs> so Madison and Monroe find each other in November of 1784, and they begin a lifelong correspondence that'll stretch over five decades. And by this point, Madison was back in the Virginia legislature, and Monroe had gone to Congress and dealt with many of the same frustrations that Madison had. Talking about the Articles of Confederation, in 1777, the Continental Congress put together a plan to try to unify the states. Before that, the Continental Congress basically existed to air grievances against Great Britain. Now they had to conduct a war against the most powerful country in the world. So in 1777, they sent the Articles of Confederation to the states. The letter that accompanied it almost sounds like an apology, and with good reason. It said, this was the best that could be adapted to the circumstances of all. Not very promising. The articles, under the Articles of Confederation, the hapless League of Friendship was unable to raise revenue of, on its own, unable to raise troops on its own. It was unable to conduct any sort of rational trade policy. So even after the war, the European powers would punish our merchants, punish our producers, hit our producers with heavy taxes and tariffs. And because the, the national government had no capacity to, to create a revenue, a, a trade policy, they were able to play the 13 states against each other. If 12 states were to respond in kind to Great Britain, at least one state would look around and say, you know what? We're going we're gonna to lower our tariff and have all these British goods come in through our state. So it was, impossible. it was impossible for the Congress to do anything. It was totally unequal to the task. The idea of some sort of North American Union actually started in 1754 with something called the Albany Congress. That was Benjamin Franklin's idea, and it was not created with the idea of independence in mind. Uh, it was created in response to the fears generated by the French and Indian War. And it was to be a body that could coordinate the response uh, to the impending war. This was attended by 17 delegates from seven colonies and one lobbyist. And, and the, the meeting broke up inconclusively, but that general framework was later adopted into our Articles of Confederation. You know, the national government was so weak at one